that. Good evening. How are y'all doing tonight? All right, that's a lot better. Uh, thank y'all so much for having us. We're really glad to be here. We've been praying for y'all, and uh, we're uh, really excited about uh, pursuing our ministry and uh, just showing you the burden that God has placed in our heart to reach a gospel, to, to reach a country of Colombia, but not Colombia, but the whole world through Colombia also with the gospel of Christ. Uh, my name is Miguel, my wife Mary Angela, and we're the Sanabria family, as Brother Andy said, and we're church planting missionaries to the country of Colombia, South America, not South Carolina. And so uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Colombia. My wife is going to come up and sing a song really quickly, and then afterwards I'll show you why we're going there. But uh, usually whenever you think about Colombia, you think about three things. And that number one is drugs, number two is crime, and number three is, yep, cough. See, it never fails. Everyone always thinks about cough. But I challenge you from now on, whenever you think about Colombia, think about the people. There's about 48, 49 million people in Colombia. 90% of them are Catholic. The other 10% are Muslims. Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, among other religions, are going there to reach the other 90%. Well, our heart and our desire with my wife is to go there and reach 100%. We want them all to know about Christ. So please pray for us. We really want to get there soon. We've been on deputation for about a year and a half. And uh, we're over 50% of our support. Lord willing, one more year, and you'll be hearing about a church plant going on in Colombia. So my wife is going to come. She's going to sing a song, and afterwards I'll bring in present a little bit, and then I'll bring a, a short message from the Word of God. Thank you. Uh, turn your Bibles to the book of Romans, chapter 10. Uh, and uh, that's always, uh, I, I hope that's for every, every single one of us. We're made uh, to serve God with our lives. And uh, that's what that song is about. And we see the example of Job, how... Whatever happened, he was still serving God. And so uh, if you could open to the book of Romans chapter 10, I'll show you why we're going to Colombia. And as you're turning there, I'll tell you a little bit about my testimony. I am from Colombia. I was born and raised up there in a Catholic home. I was baptized as a little baby. I did my first communion confirmation, which are all Catholic things that you do. But uh, I never learned those times. I never learned anything about the Bible. Never learned anything about God or Jesus or anything whatsoever about what we see in the Bible. And so I grew up in a very religious home. And at the age of 12, my mom, my brother, and myself, we fled from Colombia. And we're very thankful to this country for allowing us to come in and start a new life here. And when I came in at the age of 12, I, just, I was still a Catholic. But three years after that, uh, the Lord provided a missionary to come to uh, Alfreda to help start Vision Baptist Church, which is our home church. And as he was doing that, he uh, started doing Bible studies at our home and our uncle's home. And little by little, after Bible study and after Bible study, uh, he was going through the book of John. And as you go through the book of John, you'll find out in the book of John that uh, it, salvation is very repetitive, which is a good thing. And so as I was listening, one of the things that really uh, captivated me was when Jesus said that ye must be born again. So we all know it. But this to a lost person makes no sense at all. If you've never heard it before, if you've never seen it, nothing at all, it doesn't make any sense. And so when I heard that, I questioned myself and I said, what does that even mean? And so little by little, they started explaining from God's word itself what the, what the Bible said about it. And little by little, I started finding out that I was a lost sinner in need of a Savior and that I couldn't pay for my sins. And so one night after a couple of weeks of Bible study, one of them came up to me and he said, Miguel, do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior tonight? So I said, yeah, I mean, if, 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 if what the Bible says is true, of course I want to accept it. And so that night I repented of my sins and I trusted in Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. I realized that I could do nothing to save myself. And I realized that I had to trust 100% of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary. So God saved me that night. And afterwards, you know, I started helping out in the church, doing anything I could. I was very thankful to God and I would help out in the media in the back with the sound and everything. And I would also song lead. Uh, but the song lead only lasted for about three weeks. Because I was not very good at it. And so they said, Brother Miguel, can we use me somewhere else? I said, no problem. You know, wherever you want to use me, that's fine with me. Uh, but I just wanted to do something for God, you know. Uh, maybe not the singing part. Uh, but uh, little by little, God started working in my life. And I started reading my Bible more and more. And uh, one of the things that really uh, impacted my life after salvation was when one of the deacons encouraged me to read my Bible all the way through. And so I started doing it. And then I started reading from Genesis to Revelations, and I started finding out all these amazing stories about our amazing God that can do great, amazing things with our lives, you know. And, uh, and I challenge anybody here, if you've never read your Bible all the way through, please do it. Please take a little bit of time, 15 minutes a day from now on, and read your Bible just little by little. In about a year, if you read every, every 15 minutes every single day, 
you'll get through it, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And so I did that, and I started finding all these stories, and I, I, I wanted to be used by God. I wanted to do something big with my life, and so little by little, God started working my heart, and in 2011, at a missions camp, he called me to preach, and after that, I just started helping out anywhere I could, and there was an opening position in Norcross, Georgia, to be a youth pastor, and I knew nothing about it, and so they asked me, they said, Miguel, would you like to start helping out with the teens? And I said, I would love to, but I, the only thing I know is some things about the Bible, and that's about it, and so... Uh, I started just teaching what I knew, and little by little, got started working through that and changing people's lives, which is amazing, you know. So I started doing that. I did that for about three years. That's where I met my wife. We started working together, and God started putting us together. And as I was doing that, after that, uh, I was a youth, pa- uh, a Spanish pastor at my home church for another two years. And while I was a Spanish pastor at my home church, uh, God allowed me to go into the mission field and take a mission trip. Anybody here has taken a mission trip before? All right, a good, good amount of y'all. And so whenever I took the mission trip, I went to India. I got provided for me to go to India and to go to Peru. But whenever I went to these mission trips, you know the mission trips are very dangerous things, right? This is why. You might be thinking of the wrong dangerous type, but when I, when I talk about dangerous, I'm talking about it's dangerous because whenever you go to the mission field, you see the need around the world. You see that people in India, people in Peru, wherever you go, I think, I don't know if you went to Honduras, is that correct? I saw some some little uh, bookmarks. Wherever you went, God shows you that there's a person all the way over there that is just like you. And it's a soul for whom Christ also died for. And if they don't know about Christ, if they never hear about him, they're going to die and go to hell. And so I went and I looked at that and God started burning my heart. He got a hold of my heart. I never expected to be a missionary. My wife and I, before I took the mission trips, we we're about to buy a house. And we're about to settle down. And we're about to say, okay, we're done renting. We're buying a house. You can paint the walls however you want them. You can make as many holes as you want because that's what she wanted to do. But we came back and I said, babe, I think God's calling us to go to the mission. And uh, the reason why I started reading my Bible, I was doing my devotions one day. And I was going through the book of Romans. And so in Romans chapter 10, I'll show you where I got to go to Colombia. I was reading Romans chapter 10. And uh, the chapter right before Romans chapter 9, you're going to find out that here's Paul. And he's willing to do anything to see his own people saved. Paul really wants his countrymen to know about Christ. In Romans chapter 10 verse 1, he starts talking about him again. Look at what he says. He says, brethren, he says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I mean, it's a simple prayer, simple heart desire, but it's the most important one. It's the most important one. You know, I, I, can, I can pray for somebody to heal up, and I can pray for somebody to, uh, to, to have food, and I can pray for somebody to be well financially, but that's not really going to solve their main problem, right? And so Paul here, he said, you know, they, they might be very knowledgeable, they might be very nice people, they might follow a lot of rules, but that's not going to get them to heaven, you know? Verse number two, he continues talking about him. He says, for I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. So Paul says, you know what, my people, they're very religious people. They probably go to the synagogue every day, and they probably pray and fast and do all these big sacrifices sacrifice for God every single day. But they're doing it for the wrong reasons, right? Verse number three, look at what he says. He explains that. He says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So Paul says, you know why my people do all these big things? You know why they go to synagogue? You know why they pray and then fast? Because one day they're going to go before God and go up to God and say, God, because of all the things that I've done, am I now good enough? And am I now righteous enough to be with you forever? But God's going to turn to them and say, depart from me, I never knew you. And that is rough. Because imagine all your life doing things, doing what you think it's okay and what you're supposed to be doing, and then getting to that point and hearing that's not what you were supposed to be doing. And you don't have another chance. That's rough. So this is why Paul was willing to give his life and was willing to be stoned, was willing to do whatever so they could know about Christ and trust him. Well, as I was reading this, I was saying, Paul, you know what? Your people are just like my people in Colombia. And as I was thinking about this, I'll, I'll take you to Colombia really quickly so you know what I'm talking about. I'm from Bogota, Colombia, which is the capital city of Colombia. And over there is this big mountain it's called Monserrate. And Monserrate, from the bottom to the top, is hundreds and hundreds of feet high. 
Well, what happens over there in Bogota, Colombia is people go to this mountain, and at the side of the mountain, there's these steps that take you all the way from the bottom to the top. And what they do is they go to the beginning of the steps, and they get on their knees just like this, and they get on their hands just like this, and one by one, they start going up step by step. But as they're doing this, this is what happens. These steps, they're not made out of carpet. They're not made out of wood, but they're made out of rock. So what they do is as they're going up, their knees start bleeding, their hands start bleeding, and then they're throwing their bodies. In their minds, they're thinking, maybe if I do this, God will forgive me of the wrong things that I've done. Maybe if I do this, God will help me. Maybe if I do this, God will solve my problems. Maybe if I do this, God will do something with my life. And so they keep going up, and I mean, some of them, they actually do make it all the way to the top. And once they get all the way to the top of that mountain, there's this big, huge Catholic building over there. They go through the front doors and they're still on their knees and on their hands, bleeding and everything. They go all the way to the front of the building. And at the front of the building, there's this big statue of Christ right there. And they go up to it. They look at the face. They close their eyes. And what they do is this. They start praying to Mary. And they start praying to the saints. You know why? Because they're asking them for forgiveness. They're asking them to pay for their sins, to forgive their sins what they're doing but you know why they do this because nobody's gone up to them and said look at what the bible says look at that christ already paid for your sins on the cross of calvary and you can't pay for them that's why he came right nobody's done that and this story that i'm telling you it's a story not that i read in any book but a story that i saw year after year because i'm from there and i saw what happened so as i was reading this and i was thinking about paul's people I said, you know what? One day they're going to go before God. They're going to be right in front of them. They're going to say, God, you remember the thing that I did at that mountain? Remember how I sacrificed my body for you? How I destroyed my knees and I destroyed my hands for you, God, so I could be good enough, so I could be righteous enough to be with you forever. And God's going to look at him and say, depart from me. I never knew you. And I don't want that to happen to my people. I really don't. I don't want them to perish forever. And so you know what I did? I said, God, I see what you're doing. And the reason why I'm thinking this is not because it's just something random, but you do things the way you do them. I don't understand why, but you put this burden in my heart. And so my wife and I, we're going to go back. We're going to go tell them about you and what you've done and our plans to go over there and evangelize both so that they know what the Bible says. We're going to be starting a church so that we can bring people to the church, disciple them, preach what the Bible says to them, and as we're discipling and preaching to them what the Bible says, we're going to be praying that God saves people. And out of the people that he saves, we're going to be praying that God raises up laborers, calls men into the ministry, so we can train men, send them out all over Colombia, and from Colombia send men out to the world as church planting missionaries. Because like I told you, I am going to Colombia, and I can only be there in one, in one spot at a time. But where I am and where we are, where everyone is, we should be doing everything we can to reach the whole world with the gospel. And so that's what we're going to try to do. <laughs> I know it's a big plan, and I, I asked God, and I said, I, I was reading my Bible one day, I said, God, I don't think I can get it done. But then he answered me through his word. He says, nope, I can do it. You can't, but I can do it. And I can get anything done, because I am almighty, all-powerful. So we go in there trusting God that he can do big and mighty things. So please pray for us. We really, really, really want to get there soon. I'll open up the, the floor for uh, any questions before I go into the short uh, message, if anybody has any questions. How much is it going to cost you to go? I mean, how much per month do you need to go per month? Yes, sir. Our mission board uh, is telling us to raise between six to 7000 a month. And that is because we are the church budget at the beginning. And we're not just going to be planting one church, but our plan is to plant multiple churches. And so that's where we're going with that amount. Yes, sir. Do you have something there whenever you get there? Uh, sir? Do you have a place there? No, sir. Well, we're going to need to buy land and everything. I mean, it, we're going to go start from scratch. And so, but uh, I believe that God's going to provide. He's already been providing, and I believe that we can get it done. And so all we need is that support so we can get there and get started. Yes, sir. Very little. Uh, from what I know of, in the city that we're going to, it's the city of Medellin. And Medellin, I don't know if you heard about Pablo Escobar. Anybody heard of him? That's where he's from. And it's a city of about 4 million people. It's not as bad as it used to be before, but 
Uh, the only, from what I know, there's only two independent Baptist missionaries in the whole city. And so that's not much for four million people. Yes, sir. Well, I'm from there, so I'll have dual citizenship with my wife when we go there, uh, and I'll be able to do anything. Uh, and they've been open to any religion since 1992. That's good and bad. Good because we can go in, bad because anybody can go in. And so we're trying to get there soon <laughs> so we can get to them first. Spanish. We speak Spanish, mostly Spanish. Uh, we do have some tribes in the Amazon uh, jungle. They speak their own tribal language. Is there a King James Bible here that we can use in that language? Yes, sir. We have a, another Bible, which is uh, what would be the King James in English, but it's in Spanish. It's called the Reina Valera. How much of your support is derived so far? 50%. So of, of six, 50, about three. Yes, ma'am. Does any people know uh, our language over there? Uh, English? No, ma'am. No, ma'am. And they uh, mostly uh, Spanish in the country. And so they might know very little English, but the English that they know is just enough for uh, you to say, hello, uh, where's the bathroom, and um, are you going to buy something from us, you know? <laughs> that, that's pretty much why, I mean, whenever... Americans come through or any from any other country come through, they want to know that uh, so they can understand the business side of it. <laughs> this is the kind of question we have. While you're raising your support, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so since we started, we started a year and a half ago. Um, I was a pastor, and uh, when I resigned, I transitioned, I mean, 100% into deputation. So we started going out from that day, uh, making phone calls. We t I try to make phone calls every single day from 8 a.m. to 7, 8, 8 p.m. Uh, at night to get meetings so we can go and present our ministry. And that's what we've been doing since uh, we started. And Lord's been blessing. We have uh, every Wednesday and every Sunday booked from now until January. Lord willing, we'll be leaving at the beginning of next year. And so, yes, sir, that's what we, we do mostly. Any other question? It depends where you are. If you go, yes, ma'am. Um, in a, in the city, it's expensive. Uh, just because any city, I you, I thought it was going to be cheaper, but to rent a house, um, three bedroom, two bathroom house over there in a nice, uh, average location. It's about $500, $600 rent a month. And so I thought it was going to be $300, but that's not the case And when we went there. And so it's a little bit more than we expected. It's not extremely expensive, but it's still some cost. And so, yes, ma'am. Any, any other questions? Uh, right now on deputation, when we go to Colombia. Oh, when we go to Colombia, uh, we're going to start in, in the city of Medellin. Mostly uh, to the outskirts because uh, to buy any land in the city uh, is millions of dollars. It's expensive. <laughs> and so we're going to be in the outskirts where there's still hundreds of thousands of people out there. And so we'll be starting there and then branching out and maybe even going into the city in the future, Lord willing. Uh, but we want to reach every single corner if we can. Uh, maybe not in my lifetime, but if I can get a movement going so we can get that done, I would love to get it done. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're, uh, our mission board is out of our church. It's a local ministry out of our church. And so uh, our church is Vision Baptist Church. Our mission is Vision Baptist Missions. And so it's going to the church, and at the church we have an office for the mission board. And so anything goes, it goes straight to us. 
pretty much. But yes, sir. Any other questions? Okay. If you could please turn with your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 45. I promise I won't be too long. Maybe an hour, not two hours, but maybe just nah. Uh, Luke, chapter 24, verse 45 is something in my heart. Uh, it, this message, uh, this, uh, what we're going to be seeing in the Word of God tonight, it, it, it's something that's really um, it's been very heavy in my heart. And I hope that everyone gets a hold of this. I hope that uh, we see that the Christian life that God has given us, it's an amazing life. It's not just a, a different type of life or uh, just an ordinary life. I mean, it's an amazing life that God has given us. And I hope to show that from Scripture today. Uh, I have a quick question for you tonight. And this is a very simple question. Um, it is this. Why are we still here? Right? Why are we still here? If we're God's children, right, if, if we trust in Christ, our Lord and Savior, why are we still here? If he wants us to be with us, right, and we want to be with him, why are we still here? Well, we're still here because we have a purpose on this earth, right? Uh, Paul said in, in, in one of his letters, he says, I, I, I'd rather be with Christ. But then he said, but it's more needful for me to stay here because he had a purpose, Right? And so same thing with us. Why are we still here? Is because we have a God-given purpose, an amazing purpose, right? We have a message that he's entrusted us with to take everywhere we go that can change not only a person's life for just a little bit, but a person's life for eternity, which nothing else can do. That. And so if anybody here is thinking in their minds, I have no purpose, that's the wrong thing to think. That's a devil thought. That's not a thought from God. But if you're thinking, I have an amazing purpose, my life matters, God made me, God created me with a God-given purpose, then that's what the Bible teaches, right? And I hope to show you that from Scripture tonight. So go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 45, and this is after Jesus resurrected, went back to his disciples, and look at what he said to them. It says, then open he their understanding, that they might understand the Scriptures. Verse number 46, he says, And said unto them, Thus it is written, And thus it behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Then he says this, verse number 48, he says, And ye are witnesses of these things. So Jesus comes to them after he resurrected to his disciples, and he says, This is what the scriptures are about. If you've read the Bible, they're all about me and what I just did. I just died for the whole world so I could pay for their sins, right? And now I, this, is, this is what needs to be done. It needs to be preached among all nations so that they know about me and they can trust me, right? And then he, tell, he tells his disciples right then and there, he says, And ye are witnesses of these things. Well, number one, the Christian life is about being a bold witness everywhere we go. And that's what the Bible tells us. And that's what the disciples' lives were all about. Whenever you read your Bible, whenever you read, even in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you're going to find out that God wants the whole entire world to know about Him. But starting right here where we are, right? You look at the disciples' lives. If you go to the book of Acts chapter 5, you don't have to turn there, but you can write in your, if you're taking a notes, you can look at it later. In Acts chapter 5, we're going to find out the story of Peter and John. And Peter and John, in Acts chapter 5, they're in big, big trouble. I mean, the religious crowd in that time has gathered him up and they're telling him, stop talking about Jesus. He just went all over Jerusalem and told every single person about him and what he did. And you know what Peter and John did? I imagine they did this, not in the Bible, but they probably high five each other, you know. <laughs> they said, yeah, we did. We went all around Jerusalem. We told every single person about Jesus because that's what our God wants us to do. That's what our God wants us to do today still, Right? He wants to tell every single person that we know, everyone that is on this earth about him and him alone, right? So number one, the Christian life is about being a bold witness everywhere we go. Go with me to the book of John chapter 17, verse number 20. John chapter 17, verse number 20. In the book of John chapter 17, we're going to find out that here's Jesus and he's praying. And uh, he's praying about what, what, what's about to happen. He's about to, I mean, die a horrible, horrible death for you and for me. Not only that, he's, uh, he's about to be denied. He's about to be betrayed. I mean, he's about to go through some really, really rough times. But he does it because he loves us and he cares for us, right? 
And afterwards, he prays for his disciples right then and there. He prays that they would be kept from evil so they can go into this world and take the gospel all over the world. And then he prays for another group of people. Does anybody know who he prays for? For us, right here, right now. It's amazing. Whenever I read this in the Bible, I mean, it just, I was really excited. Look at what it says in John chapter 17, verse number 20. It says, he says, Jesus, he says, neither pray I for these alone. He talks about his disciples. But then he says, but for them also we shall believe on me through their word. Who's that? That's us, right? We have one author, which is God. 40 plus writers, which he used to write the Bible that we have right here in front of us. And if you and I believe on what Christ said because of what the Bible says, then he's talking about you and me right here, right now. Right? Look at what he, why he prays for us. Verse number 21, he says this. He says, that they all may be one as thou, Father, are in me, and I in thee that they also may be one in us. This is why, that the world may what? Believe that thou hast sent me. This is the whole reason why you and I are here today. Right? This is the whole reason why we come to church on Wednesdays and Sundays. This is the whole reason why, I mean, we're holy as He is holy. We, we come to church not just to listen to the preaching, go back home and say, wow, really good preaching today. But I'm just going to go back to work and eh, it's just going to say it's really good preaching. <laughs> no, it's not because of that. We come to church, we listen to the preaching, and we want to allow that preaching the, of, the word of, God, of, uh, of the Word of God to enter into our lives and change us. And we start obeying, we start doing what the preaching says to do, what the Bible says to do, and then God starts doing big and amazing things in our lives, right? we here with a purpose. You know why we're holy as He is holy? Not so that people look at us and say, wow, what a good person. Look at that person, right? They're so clean, they don't say any bad words or anything like that. They're so nice. Not why. You know why we're holy as He is holy? So that people look at us and say, wow, there's something different about it. I don't know what it is, but something happened with their lives, and I want to know why. And when they come to you, when they come to us, you know what we tell them? Let me tell you who changed my life. I wasn't like this before, but whenever he came into my life, he made a big change. Right? That's what we're doing this. That's why we're here, so that people would know about him. Right? So number one, the Christian life is about being a bold witness. Everywhere we go, God wants us to tell people about him. I hope whenever you go into your family gatherings, which we have quite a bit of them, you go in there and you go with your Bible. And they look at you probably as the uncle or the aunt, and whenever they go up to you, you tell them, I got to tell you about what I read today in my Bible. Let me tell you what God told me. Let me tell you what God says. He's an amazing God, and I hope you get to know him one of these days. I hope that day is today. That should be us, right? The Christians and our families, that should be us. Whenever we go to work, I hope people look at you and they look at me and maybe we're going through something rough, you know, which thinks life is full of problems. But then they look at you and they say, they're in this problem, but there, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> you know, not in a bad way, but in a good way, right? They're rejoicing, they're happy, they're excited. No matter what happens in their lives, I mean, they're still going forward. What's wrong with them? And they come to you and they say, okay, what's going on with you? You're not like the others. You're not like the other people that throw a fit. What's wrong with you? And then you say, I have an amazing God. And he loves me and he cares for me. And I want you to know about him. Whenever you go to the grocery store or the gas station, people should always look at you and say, okay, I know what they're about to do. And I know what they're putting their hand in their pockets. I know. They're going to take out this track and they're going to hand it to me and they're going to invite me to their church I know that person. That should be us. Because God wants the whole world, starting right here where we are in our community, to know about Him. We should be bold witnesses. Number two, go with me to the book of John, chapter 9, verse 4 and 5. I hope this isn't too hard. Is it? No. I, I don't want you to go out of here tonight and say, oh, brother, what a heavy message. But I want you to go out of here tonight and encourage not because we have a lot of things to do, but because God wants to use your life in a great and mighty way. He really does. I mean, we're not ordinary people. We're God's children. We're the children of the amazing God that can do amazing things that created the earth, that created the sun, that created the moon, that created us. He can do big and amazing things in our lives. He really can if you trust and believe in Him. 
John chapter 9, verse 4 and 5, we're going to be seeing how Jesus lived his life, right? And uh, before we look at these two verses, let me ask you a quick question. Anybody can answer it. What do people call us? A anybody? Okay, good. I was worried. I thought I was in the wrong place. <laughs> but we're called Christians, right? And the word Christian means that we're supposed to be Christ. Good. We all know this. So the Bible, it shows us how, how Jesus, how Christ, he lived his life. And the Bible also says that God is molding us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, because he wants us to be like. So look at the way he lived his life. Look at verse number 4 in John chapter 9. He says, this is Jesus Christ. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me. Right? Let me stop right there for a little bit. For Jesus Christ, it was a must to do what he was sent here to do. To accomplish the mission, the task that he was sent here to do. Right? It was his number one priority. In the book of Luke chapter 2, we're going to find out that at the age of 12, he was busy about his father's business. Right? And so must be the same with us. I hope that in our lives, the number one priority is to live for God. That should be a number one priority. But you know what usually happens? We have family and we have jo uh, a job. We have uh, to do this and we have to mow the lawn and all these things. And then uh, I guess I can put God as number eight. That shouldn't be that way. I mean, our God should be our number one priority. That's the way Jesus left his example for us to live here on this earth, right? Look at what it says in, in the second part of this verse. He says, while it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. He says, this is why we need to put God as our priority because we don't have much time to accomplish what we're here to do. We don't have much time. And you and I both know this. We don't have tomorrow promised. We don't have the next week promised. We don't have the next, we don't have anything promised, right? So he says, we don't have much time. And we usually have this tough reminder. But whenever somebody loved one in our family passes away, it's another reminder. And it's another reminder that life is very, very short on this earth. Then he says, knowing this, verse number 5, look at what he says. He says, as long as I am in the world, he says, I am, what's it say right there? The light of the world, right? Jesus knew he had numbered days, but he was busy. I mean, he was constantly going around preaching the kingdom of God. He was for three and a half years, he was training 12 men so they can, after he goes, they can go all over the world and take the gospel all over the world, right? He was busy. So he says, I hope you're also busy. I hope wherever you go, you're a light to everyone you meet because this world is full of darkness, right? When the Bible talks about darkness, it doesn't talk about people robbing or people doing bad things or saying bad things. When the Bible talks about darkness, it talks about people being blinded by the devil. People being blinded by the riches of this world, by the fame of this world. And God is saying, my dear sons, my dear daughters, please go into their lives and shine brightly so they will know about me. That's what the Bible is saying. Because there is not much time. You know, for us, no problem. Because we, with us, absent from the body, we are... But for them... Absent from the body is not present with the Lord, right? So we don't have much time, but we have a mission, right? So we must be urgent about the Father's business. That's number two. The Christian life is about being urgent about the Father's business. Go with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verse 14. Matthew, chapter 25, verse 14. And uh, this is a story of the parable of the talents. And uh, I'm not going to go through the whole story, but I'll tell you what happens here. And I hope whenever you get there, if you're taking any notes or writing anything right, Brother Miguel told me to read this when I get home tonight. If not tonight, tomorrow night. Please do. It's an amazing story. But this is what happens in this story. There's this master, this Lord, and uh, he's about to go on a journey. He's very, very wealthy. He has tons and tons of money. He also has servants. And so he calls up three of his servants up to him, and he says, okay, <laughs> servants come along. And so they come up to him, and he goes up to servant number one. He says, servant number one, he says, I'm going to give you Five talents, right? And then he goes up to servant number two, says, servant number two, I'm going to give you two talents, right? And then he goes up to servant number three, says, servant number three, I'm going to give you one talent. Then he tells him what to do with those talents, and he goes off on his journey. And time passes by, and then the master comes back, and he calls up servants again. And he says, okay, servants of mine, come along. Let's see what you did with the talents that I gave you, right? So he goes up to servant number one, says, servant number one, how many talents did I give you? 
Yeah, the front better, the back we can work it. No problem. So he said five. He says, what'd you do? He says, Lord, give me five talents. I went and rested in the mall, and I got another five. He says, well done, my good and faithful servant, right? Then he goes up to servant number two. He says, servant number two, how many talents did I give you? There's two stories about the parable of the talents. No problem. He said three. It's okay. But this one is two. <laughs> then he said, what'd you do? He says, Lord, you gave me two talents. I went and rested in the mall, and I get another two. He says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then he goes up to server number three. He says, server number three, how many times did I give you? We all got this one. <laughs> What'd you do with it? He says, Lord, exactly. I went and hit it. I went and buried it. I was afraid. I didn't do what you told me to do with it. And then the master comes up to that third servant and he says this. He says, it's rough. He says, good for nothing servant. You did not do what I told you to do with the talent that I gave you. Were you expecting that in the story? I wasn't. I thought the servant was going to go up to, uh, the master was going to go up to that servant and say, hey, no problem. It's okay. Hey, and not a big problem, not a big matter. That's not what happened. And I understand why now, because this master, that task, that, 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 that talent that he gave him, it was a serious matter. And it really mattered that he would do what he was told to do with it. You know how this applies to our lives, this story, you know who the master is, right? The master is God. You know what he's saying to you and I here today? He's saying, my dear sons, my dear daughters, he says, number one, I gave you life. He says, number two, I gave you your family. He says, number three, I gave you your job. He says, number four, I gave you everything that you own. And it's not for you to take it and do whatever you please with it and whatever your will is with it, but it's for you to take it and say, Father, thank you very much for all that you've given me. Thank you for my life. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my job. Thank you for everything that you've given me, Father. You're so good to me. And Father, not only that, thank you for coming down and dying on the cross for me. Thank you for saving me. Father, you're so good to me. And you love me very much, and I know this. And Father, I, I love you, and I've read your word. I know what your desire is. I know that your desire is for the whole world to know about you, Father. So this is what I'm going to do. Beginning with my life, I'm going to give my life to you. And however you please to use it, however you want to use it, you do it, Father. If you want me to serve, I'll serve. If you want me to sing, I'll sing. If you want me to tell people about you, I'll tell people about you. Whatever you want me to do, Father, I'll do it. Isn't this what this story is about? Us giving everything that God has given us back to Him and for His honor and for His glory so that He can use it as He pleases. And we know what His desire is. Right? Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, God has been so good to us that you present your bodies a holy and acceptable unto God, which is your, it's the least that we can do. I mean, the very least that we can do for God is to give our lives to Him. Right? And this story, just like that master left and came back, Jesus has gone, but He's coming back very soon. And before he left, he gave us a task and he gave us everything that we needed. He gave us the Holy Ghost that gives us power to go and be bold witness everywhere we go. And to take the gospel that he entrusted us with throughout this whole world. And he's coming back very soon. And when he comes back, you know what I want him to say of me? Well done, my good and faithful servant. I think everyone here wants to hear that, right? So... Number two, the Christian life is about being urgent about the Father's business. There's not much time to get it done. Number three, I'll finish right here. John chapter 4, verse 34. Go with me over there. John chapter 4, verse 34. And uh, here we find out the story of the Samaritan woman. And it's an incredible story. I love the story because we see how Jesus, uh, he shows everyone that he wants people in Samaria to know about him. Usually the Jews and the Samaritan, they hated each other. Right? The, the, a Jew would not set foot on Samaria. But Jesus says, no, I must go to Samaria and I must go to Sakaar so they would know about me. And so he goes and as he goes there, he tells disciples to go get some meat. And so his disciples are going to go get some meat. They think Jesus is very hungry. And so they're getting the meat. And as he's getting the meat, we see the story of the Samaritan woman being displayed out. We see what happens that she eventually trusts in him and she goes back to the people that she came from. And she says, isn't this the Messiah? 
You need to go and talk to him. You need to go and listen to him. You need to go and see who he is. Which is exactly what you and I are supposed to be doing when we know about Jesus. Isn't he amazing? Isn't he wonderful? I mean, what did he do with our lives? So God wants us to go back to the people that we came from and say, look at the things that he done. Look at what he has done with my life. And he can do the same thing with your life. He is an amazing God, an amazing, 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 wonderful, prince of peace. He's amazing. You need to know him. But in the midst of this story, his disciples are coming back with the meat, you know. So they're coming back with the meat for Jesus, and they said, Jesus, here's the meat that you told us to bring, right? And Jesus stands right there, and he says, ah, no, I'm good, thank you very much. And you can just imagine the disciples are probably scratching their heads and saying, Jesus, what happened? <laughs> I thought you told us to go all the way over there, and get the meat, and come all the way back here. And it took us a while, Jesus, and we brought it so you could eat this meat that you told us to bring. And then Jesus says, no, 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 no. I have a lesson, very important lesson for you to learn. So look at what Jesus tells them in John chapter 4, verse 34. He says this. He says, Jesus saith unto them, he says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus says, my meat, what satisfies me, what fills me up, is to do the will of him that sent me. When Jesus Christ came here, he was not going to be satisfied by doing something else besides what God had told him to do, what the Father had told him to do, what he had sent him to do on this earth. I mean, he came here and he was doing every single day what he came here to do. He was busy about his father's business. But you know how this applies to our lives? And he was satisfied in what he did. He was content in what he was doing. But you know how he, this applies to our Christian lives today, right here, right now? This is how it applies. You and I will never, never, ever, ever be satisfied, content, or filled up in our Christian lives unless we're doing what God told us to do. How can we be? Right? How can we be satisfied in our Christian life? How can we be seeing God doing big and amazing things in our Christian lives when we're not reading our Bibles like we're supposed to? Or when we don't pray like we're supposed to? Or when we don't witness like we're supposed to? Right? How can we be seeing God doing great, amazing things in our Christian lives? The Christian life is not about us, but it's about who? It's about Him and Him alone. And whenever we serve Him, whenever we obey Him, Whenever we do what he told us to do, he's going to look at you and he's going to look at me and he says, wow, wonderful. That's exactly what I was waiting for them. I was just waiting for them to come up to me and say, Father, here's my life. And Father, I want to see big things being done. And then he's going to say to us, wow, let me show you who I am. Let me show you my power. Let me show you my strength. Let me show you the amazing things that I can do with your life. But I can only show them to you when you have faith in me. When you trust me. Right? And that's when we're going to see God doing big things in our Christian lives are being full of content and full of joy. But if we don't do those things, we're going to be like the average person that comes to those doors and looks at their watch and say, and now where I'm gone out of here, going back to what I was having fun doing. And the Christian life is not going to be much to you. But when we do what he tells us to do, it's going to be an amazing life. Look what he says, second part of this verse, and I'll finish right here. He says, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And then it says, and to finish his work. Right? Jesus Christ was not completely satisfied until he went up on that cross and he said, it is finished. He wasn't. Right? He, he, he knew the cost. He knew what he was going to go through because he is God. He saw what was going to happen. But he said, I'm going to go through. I'm going to finish what I came here to do. I will not quit on them. Right? Just like he didn't quit on us, on the whole world, right? Just like he wasn't satisfied until he died on that cross, he finished what he came here to do. You and I cannot be completely satisfied until the 7.4 billion people on this earth know about him. We can't be. And that's a lot of people, <laughs> you know? But God wants us all to have a big part in it, right? We can't be satisfied. I hope that you don't go home every night and say everything's okay and everything's fine. Nobody needs Jesus. We'll be okay. But I hope you go home thinking 
I need to do something more for Jesus. I need to tell somebody else about Jesus. Somebody else needs to know. I need to do something so that the world will know about Jesus. We can't be satisfied until the work is done. So number three, the Christian life is about never, ever, ever giving up. Never. Never quitting. Because he never quit on us. He could have chosen to say, they're wicked. They're wrong. They're not doing what I told them to do. They don't love me. They don't care about me. I'm done with them. He could have done that. But he says, no, no, no. I love them. And I care for them. And I don't want them to die. I don't want them to perish forever. So I'm going to go and die for them. So they can be with me forever. Number three, the Christian life is about never, ever, ever giving up on what God has sent us to do. Let's pray.